I appreciate all of you here today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> My topic today is dividing the Bible. And we'll start in Genesis chapter 1 and read this verse to save some time. Then I'll go to the others. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 will be the first verse that we read. In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this privilege to be able to stand and be able to know that we have the truth in our hands and we know how to rightly divide the truth and we've come to the knowledge of the truth. And thank you for all these dear saints that are here today. We just pray that this lesson on dividing the Bible will be a, a help and a blessing to each one that, uh, that we can edify and give you the glory and honor for it for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Dividing the Bible, looking at Genesis chapter 1 there in verse 1, in, in the beginning uh, God created the heaven and the earth. And you think about the Bible that I read out of, it is authority. King James Bible is the truth. Psalm 119.42 says, For I trust in thy word. So I trust the word of God that I have today. I can trust it and I can believe it. And, but you know, a lot of times we say we do and we don't. Uh, I know that I was saved in, in, in 1970 and I had to go from one religious system to another and ended up going to a Bible school in Chattanooga and all of you probably down that way know that that's Tennessee Temple. I went down there and learned a little bit of division through one person and I didn't learn enough but I learned enough to keep me out of the law system for a lot of years but then coming to the knowledge of the truth makes all the difference in the world but what you do a lot of times, you say you trust the Bible, but yet we don't believe it. We don't do what it says. And I was in that situation myself. And then you learn what the Word of God says. And every word's pure is what Proverbs says in, in chapter 30 there. Uh, you know, the question is, why would you want to change the Bible? You've, yeah, it's a Bible that I trust for my salvation. It's a Bible that I, it's true. And, and all, why would you want to change it? Well, in Genesis 1-1, the modern Bibles change this verse. And all of you know that. And they'll change that there from heaven. There they'll put heavens, plural, in there. So why would you want to change what the, the Word of God that's truth, true there? And, you know, looking at it, John 17, 17 says, Thy Word is truth. We've got the truth. And Colossians 3, 16, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And we ought to let it dwell in us. We ought, to read, we ought to read the Word of God, search the Scriptures out, and we ought to study the Word of God. Well, how are we going to study it? Well, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. So the Bible tells you to study. It tells you how to study. And it says rightly divide it. Well, who tells you to rightly divide it? We know Paul does. Well, where do you find that at in Paul's letters in Ephesians chapter 2? The timeline's there. It's time past, but now, and the ages to come. And, you know, I used to look at it by dividing the Bible by dispensations. Well, there's dispensations in the timelines, but you need to divide by time. You need to use that timeline because Paul lays that out for us, and he has given the doctrine to us, and so therefore we ought to divide it that way. So it makes all the sense in the world to me to to read the Bible, search the Scriptures out, rightly divide it, and you come to the knowledge of the truth, you're following Paul and the, the doctrine, so that's where we're at and but now. Let me give you an example, too, about time past with the nation of Israel. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we'll look at this one. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. I'm going to use this as an example. I mean... We're in but now, and I'm saying we ought to read the Scriptures, search the Scriptures out, rightly divide, study it, rightly divide it, and all. I mean, that, that should be a daily thing for us. Well, you look in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6, uh, talking about the nation of Israel now, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So we know the heart's the inner part of man. It's going to be in your heart. And thou shalt uh, teach them diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them with thy, when thou sittest in, thy ha in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Now, that's a command to the nation of Israel. They had the law, you know that. And here they are uh, telling them to teach and to talk. And 
When you sit down, talk about it. And when you walk, talk about it. And when you lie down, you think about it. And you rise up, you're talking about it again. So you've got it on your mind. It's in your inner being. Uh, the, the Jews were to have the law, the commandments in them like that. Well, what about us? We're to have it in our inner man. Let it give us strength and walk that way and live that grace life. We know what the truth is, so we walk that way and we live that way. And, you know, that's what I found, and that's why it excites me to be here today and, and understand that we do have the truth in our hands. And, you know, there's a verse, and I won't turn to it. Uh, Elijah, he had it in his mouth. He spoke it. And uh, the, the, the lady there he was dealing with, the woman there, understood that. He had the truth in his mouth, and we've got the truth. And we've got it in our mouth. Speak it out. Give it out. Make it available to everybody that we come into contact with. That's very important for us in the work of the ministry. And I've said all that to you. We'll go back. Uh, the purpose behind the lesson today is to identify the basic division of the Bible between prophecy and mystery and between Israel and the body of Christ. And if you don't rightly divide the Bible, you can't do that. And that's why you have to rightly divide. So going back to Genesis 1.1, we read that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You know, that's introducing us to the Bible. Here we are, mankind, and God gives a complete Bible to us, and He introduces the Word of God to us, and He tells us something there in that verse, in the beginning God created. Well, what did God create? Well, He created the heaven and the earth is what He created. That's what the Word of God says there. And what kind of quality of work did God do? He did perfect work. Everything God did was perfect. He didn't halfway do it like man would, would do, but he did everything perfect. Here's an example. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. <clears throat> and we'll read verse 4. When God does something, he does it perfect. You don't have to worry about it being partly done or three-fourths done, but it's, it's done. It's perfect. Deuteronomy 32, 4, and you'll notice there the rock too in this verse, Deuteronomy 32, 4, He is the rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are judgment. <clears throat> a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. I mean, notice that. He is the rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are judgment. All of, God, all of His ways, the rock's ways, you know who the rock is. The Lord Jesus Christ, His ways are perfect. And when God does something, He does it perfect. And uh, Brother Ted read last night, Colossians 1.16, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth. goes right back. I know governmental authority and all that, but you can go right back to Genesis 1.1. It was all created. And did God have a purpose in creating the heaven and the earth? The answer is yes, He did. We know that. It was twofold purpose. And He gives you that in Genesis 1.1. You've got the heaven there and you've got the earth. So what we're going to do, we're going to identify the basic difference of the, uh, between prophecy and mystery today. And I'm going to give you the prophecy one first, then I'll get, compare it with the mystery part. We'll do that comparison as we go on. But before we do that, I'm going to say this about religion. And you know, most of us came out of religious systems. And we were far short of the truth. We have had salvation. We believe the gospel and thank the Lord we were saved. But as far as coming to the knowledge of the truth, a lot of us didn't have the truth and didn't understand the truth and really didn't know how to get the truth. I mean, you can just add all that together. So we were kind of in a mess, if you look at it. We had that fear syndrome. I know I, I, and I went to a Bible school and graduated in Chattanooga, and I know those evangelists would come in and they'd put the law to you, and then you'd doubt, hey, am I saved or not? You know, you'd have that kind of fear syndrome when, the, when they left. Instead of building you up, guess what? You're going the opposite way. And that makes a big difference in our lives. But the religious system, most division in the Bible, the religious system, they'll say, well, there's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now that's how down our way and in Tennessee, a lot of people will tell you that it's divided that way. And they'll say, well, the Old Testament's for the Jews and the New Testament's for us. And, you know, you think about that, Here's what happen when you, happens when you do that. I had a, one of my relatives years back, I, I'd learned some division, but I shared with him that you've got to follow Paul, Pauline doctrine. And you know what he replied back to me? He said, I, I'd rather follow Peter. Well, when you follow Peter, you're, pro, you're following prophecy. 
the nation of Israel, you're following something that's not to you, and therefore you're thoroughly confused. And that's exactly the way this person was, and it was sad that it was like that. But you've got, you know, if you, if you divide the old and new like what the religious system says, then when you come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you've got a problem if you believe the Bible. See, I trust the Word. I read the Word, for I trust in thy Word, thy Word's truth. If you really believe that, then you'll believe what Hebrews 9 says. So turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll read verses 16 and 17. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. We're talking about the religious system. They want to divide the Old Testament for the Jews and New Testament for us, and we know that's not true. Uh, and if you did it that way, then they, there's a problem with Hebrews 9 there in verses uh, 15 and, or 16 and 17. Hebrews 9, 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the test. Uh, uh, testifier, uh, testator. For a testament of, is a force after men are dead, otherwise is it of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Well, you know this, Christ didn't die until the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I've got them written down in my Bible. Matthew is chapter 27 is when he died. You've got Mark, Luke, uh, Mark there is in chapter 15, Luke chapter 23, and John, uh, I can't even read my writing there chapter, what is that, 19? But that tells you that if, if Christ didn't die until the end, what did Christ come, come on the law? Galatians 4 says He did. So the law is in effect. So the whole time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you don't rightly divide the Bible, all you're doing is preaching and teaching law, and that's what the religious system's doing today. And yet, they, they say, we've never heard rightly dividing. Well, there's several reasons why they've not heard it, but uh, we won't do all that today. But understand something. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. There's a two-fold system there, purpose for God doing that. Uh, uh, you look at the purpose concerning the earth, it's not the same as the heaven. You can see that in Genesis 1.1. -1. They're, they're not the same. Heaven's not the same as, as the earth. And people overlook that, but yet people say, well, I believe the Bible, I trust it, the Word's true. And uh, they may carry a King James Bible around and yet say that and, and read out of it every day but still not know how to rightly divide the Word of Truth. So we're going to go to Acts. I'm going to do the comparison now. I'm going to show you the prophecy first. Then we'll do the mystery. So turn to Acts chapter 3. We'll look at that. <clears throat> and we're going to go down through these. Uh, we'll do prophecy and mystery first. Then we'll do Israel and the body of Christ. So uh, hopefully we can get through and... Hopefully it'll be clear to you and the clarity will be good and you'll be edified and we can give God the glory for it. So in Acts chapter 3, verse 21, this is an important verse. And you might as well get Luke 1, 70. We'll read that. Luke chapter 1 and verse 70. These two verses uh, we can put together. Acts 3, 21 and Luke 1, 70. <clears throat> So we'll read Acts 3.21 first. Acts 3.21 Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. Now you look at it, we're talking about God here. Peter, God has spoken. Well, how did He speak? He spoke by the mouth of all of His holy prophets. Well, when did He speak it? Since the world began. So prophecy has been since the world began. If you've got prophets, you've got prophecy. Is that correct? So we know it started since the world began. And with that, Luke, 1, 7, Luke chapter 1 and verse 70, And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been, notice that, have been since the world began. So you can't miss that. Prophecy has been since the world began. And uh, I'm not going to go, I'm doing the basic part today for you, but prophecy has been since the world began, and how people miss that is because they don't believe what the Word of God says. And there, there, a lot of times, and I know dealing with people that I've dealt with over the years, I know this one man in particular, I talked to him about rightly dividing the Word one day, and he told me, he said, well, I need to go and, and ask my pastor what, it, what he thinks about it. Well, you know, you've got somebody inside you that can teach you, 
and you've got the Bible you can trust. So believe what the Bible says and not believe what I say or what some man says. That's the issue with the whole thing. Now, comparing Acts 3.21 and Luke 170, go to Romans 16 on the mystery. That's the prophecy. So it's been since the world began. Well, what about the mystery? In Luke, in, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. I know we'll have a lot of Scripture, but the Word will speak for itself. Romans 16, 25. Paul says, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. We know where the, my gospel comes from. And the teaching, uh, preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. So the prophecy program began from the time the world began, and here the mystery program was kept secret. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to look at the the mystery there. It's kept secret since the world began. So what is a mystery? We'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we'll look in verse 7. What is a mystery? If it's kept secret since the world began, well, what is it? Well, you know, the religious system, they don't know what the mystery is for the most part. I mean, it's, it's still kept secret to many, many believers out there today. They need to come to the knowledge of the truth. They need to know what the truth is and be able to relax in who they are in Christ and just rejoice, hey, I'm saved, I'm heaven bound, I've got a work of the ministry I want to do here on this earth. I want to see people saved and I want to see them after they're saved. Come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, that's, that's an important thing there. And you, you look at that, well, what is a mystery? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7 But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world and our glory. Well, look at that. What is a mystery? Well, it tells you there, uh, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. So the mystery is hidden wisdom. And not only that, when did God ordain it? Well, he tells you there, before the world and our glory. That's what he, he ordained the the hidden uh, mystery, the wisdom before the world there. So when was it made known? And I'm just doing the simplicity part of it. Look in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. When was the mystery made known? It was ordained before the world, and it's been kept secret since the world began. Well, who, who did he reveal it to? <clears throat> and Ephesians chapter 3, verse, we'll read verses 1, 2, and 3. Ephesians 3, 1. In Ephesians 3, 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. You know, that's, I'm a Gentile, so it's to me. And look, and if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you. So we're talking about the dispensation of the grace of God. It was given to Paul. And he also says how, that, how, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. That's that hidden wisdom there. It had been kept secret. It was formed, ordained before the world. And it's revealed through the Apostle Paul. And you'll find in verse 5, the mystery, if you, if you go down to verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, it is now revealed in His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Paul got it, and he revealed it to others. And the Holy Spirit taught. So you think about how the mystery came and all. And look in verse 9, Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. So who had it hid? God did. God hid it. Well, you know, people say, well, I don't understand why God hid it. Well, what do you think man does? Man's bad to gossip. Not only that, but the devil's out there, and devil, the devil would pick it out and, and find out about it. You know, he, you think about his smartness and what he has and what he, how crafty he is. So God had it hid, who created all things by Jesus Christ. is hid in God. And how long was it hid? Ephesians 3, 3 says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. It was hid until Paul got saved. When he gets saved, he gets the mystery. That's how long it's hid. And you know, is that a difference? There's a difference between prophecy and mystery there. So uh, you, you, think about, you think about that part there, and you go on down now, if you understand there's a difference between prophecy, there is. There's a difference between the mystery, there is, between prophecy and mystery there. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was for Israel. The heaven was for the body of Christ. And that's what we're going to look at next uh, about Israel's prophecy. The uh, body of Christ is a mystery. The, you think about man. 
from the very, very beginning. God did everything perfect. Man's the problem. It started with Adam, and Adam sinned. We know that. Well, you go right on. When man began to uh, multiply on the face of the earth and all that, what happens in Genesis 11? Man falls. Well, when they fall there, what did God do? He gave them up, according to Romans 1. He gave them over. I mean, the reprobate mind, the whole works. I mean, man has fallen. They didn't want God, and they didn't want Him in their inner in their heart. They wanted Him out. They didn't want any knowledge of Him. They wanted to do their own thing, and that, that's exactly what they were doing. So you think about when did God choose Israel? Well, God chose Israel after man falls. I mean, you think about it. Man's fallen. The Gentiles are fallen. So he chooses Israel. Well, when did God choose the body of Christ? After Israel falls. That's when he chooses the body of Christ. Israel is already ordained before the world. It's going to happen. Nobody knew it, but God is hitting God. And so Israel falls in Acts 7, 51. They, they blaspheme the Holy Ghost in that chapter. And when they fall, then what does God do? He saves a Jew uh, named Saul on, on the road to Damascus there and changed his name to Paul and gives him the mystery, the revelations revealed to him. So that, that's where we're at today. So we want to go back for just a minute, though, and look at, at Abraham. Go back to Genesis chapter 12. This will kind of help a little bit more. Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> so we, this, the question on the, this question is, when did God choose Israel? Uh, uh, well, who did God choose uh, as far as choose for His purpose so it would be e executed on this earth? God had a purpose for Israel. And God chose Abram. That's the next thing there. Who did God choose? He chose Abram. You look in Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. Notice the word nation singular. It's not plural. One nation there, a great nation, uh, make, of thee, or make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And, you, and he departed in verse 4. He did what God told him to do. Well, going on to chapter uh, three, uh, 13 there, in verse 15, you'll find, you're talking about Abram now, you talk, verse 15, For all the land which thou seest, uh, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And verse 15, And for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed how long? Forever. So you've got Abram goes out, he's got the seed, and the land's going to be given to him, and the seed is going to be forever there. Well, you compare that. When God, who did God choose uh, to execute his purpose on the earth? He chose Abram, without a doubt. Well, who did God choose to execute His purpose in the heavens? He chose Paul. Now go to, we're coming back to, well, before I go back, go there, uh, look on to Genesis 17. Genesis 17, let me do this about Abram. So you got Abraham, his name, three things here in Genesis 17. You'll find in verse 5, Abram's name changes to Abraham. Genesis 17, 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So his name's changed there. And there's something else there you'll find, if you'll read on down there in these verses 9 through 14. And God said to Abraham, Thou shalt keep my co covenant, therefore thy and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And, he, and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh or his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So get a picture of it. Here you've got Abraham. You think about Abraham covenant and all that, the circumcision and all that, the land, the seed, and all that. What you've got in verses 9 through 14, you've got that middle wall of partition goes up for the Jews, the nation of Israel. The wall goes up, and 
What you've got in verse 14, you've got the world's divided. It's divided in two parts. You've got the uncircumcised and the circumcised. It's what you have. Uncircumcision and circumcision in verse 14. So that's what you've got there. I mean, you've got in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. You've got the earth, the nation of Israel, and God chooses Abraham for the earth, for Israel there. And now you've got the, the promise given to him. You've got the Abrahamic covenant. And you've got the circumcision. The middle wall of partition goes up. The Gentiles have been given up on Genesis 11. They've been, uh, uh, they've got a reprobate mind, all these type things. So it's, it's about Israel. They've got the blessing. A Gentile has to go through Israel to get the blessing from that, that point. So that's very important. Well, what do you think about the body of Christ? Who did God choose? And we know God chose Paul, which his name was Saul. So turn to Acts chapter, I'm sorry, yes, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 9, in Acts chapter 9, and we'll read verses 5 and 6. This has been a help to me in the way I see these scriptures here in Acts chapter 5, 9, verse 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? Paul met Saul. And the Lord said unto him, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go in the city and you shall be told thee what thou must do. Now you've got Saul, and all of, you, all of you know by reading how ungodly he was, how wicked he was, but yet he calls him Lord. And there, there's, a, there's a good reason for that. Uh, hold your place there and go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3. Saul calls him Lord. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you're looking... Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, you learn something by searching the Scriptures, comparing Scripture. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Wherefore I give unto you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Well, how did Saul get the Holy Ghost? He believed the gospel. He was saved. He had to. And when I, when I say that, you think 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For by one spirit are we all baptized in one body. Well, who was the first one in the body of Christ? Paul was. And he, was, he believed the gospel. He was saved. Well, what gospel did he believe? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he raised again the third day. I mean, it, it's easy to see that just when you believe the Word of God. And by looking at that there, you, you know, God's... What he's doing today, God's forming one new man. And he's turned to Ephesians chapter 2 before I say that. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And you'll look in verse 15. Ephesians 2, 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make him himself of twain, one new man. Well, who's the one new man? Body, body of Christ. And it, uh, so making peace. Verse 14, For he, that's Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So when grace comes in, the middle wall is gone. He broke it down. The, the circumcision is no longer, and circumcision is not an, uh, not an issue, and uncircumcision is not an issue. So, the question leads to this. Next question is, why did God choose Israel? Well, He chose Israel to execute His purpose on the earth. Let me show, share something with you. Turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 7 about Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Why did God choose Israel? Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6, 7, and 8. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For thou art a holy people, if you're holy, you're set apart for the purpose which, which were, you were created. So, for thou art a holy people in the Lord thy God, talking about Israel, the Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Gentiles have fallen. They're, he gave up on them. Uh, verse 7, The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people but because the Lord loved you. That's very important there. He chose Israel because He loved them. He, he loved Israel, but 
because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn in your fathers, hath the Lord bought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He, God loved him. He chose Abram and, and God loved Israel. You, you keep that in mind. And understand, why did God choose the body of Christ to be the heavenly? Well, turn back to Ephesians 5, 25, and we could read more, but for time we can't. Ephesians 5, 25, why did God choose the body of Christ? Ephesians 5, 25. He chose us, uh, heavenly people, to execute His purpose in the heavenly places. Well, in 5, 25, Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. He loved the church. God loved Israel, but He also loved the church. Two programs there. He loved both. And that's, that's very important that we see that and understand that. So why did God choose Israel? The next question is, what's the goal of prophecy? Well, the goal of prophecy is to reclaim the earth. Who's the God of this world? Satan is. So the goal of prophecy is to reclaim the earth. And how, what's he going to do? He's going to do it with a kingdom. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And we'll read verse 44. So one day this earth is going to be reclaimed and he's going to do it with the nation of Israel. And you know the religious system that I was in for a long time, we couldn't figure out you know, the second coming, we thought we'd be coming back. That's how ignorant we were. You know, and set up that kingdom, but we didn't understand what we'd be doing on the ki in the kingdom. We wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be doing anything here on this earth. We're heavenly people. That's why we couldn't understand it, because we didn't have the Bible divided and hadn't come to the knowledge of the truth uh, when we did that. So looking at that there in, in Daniel 2, 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left in other people, uh, to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. There's going to be a literal, visible, earthly kingdom on this earth, and it's going to stand forever, and it, the nation of Israel will be in that kingdom here on this earth. So that's, that's what the goal of prophecy is, is to reclaim the earth. Well, what's the goal of the, uh, of the, as far as the, mystery, the body of Christ goes? To reclaim the heavenly places. Well, who's up in the heavenly places today? And you heard it last night. Satan's up there. Uh, his, the angels, uh, fallen angels are up there. And one day, they're going to be cast out and we're going to take over. So we're going to reclaim that one day, the body of Christ. We're a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells you. We're a new creature in Christ. God's making a new man. And you know, with that new man, it doesn't make, it's uncircumcision and circumcision, that's not the issue. The issue is you believe the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection, Christ died for sins and was buried and raised again. And we're one in Christ. So what gospel did the Lord Jesus Christ preach when He came to this earth? He came to this earth and He had a ministry and we all know it was the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 4, 23. That's the gospel He preached. If you don't have that written down, it's Matthew 4, 23. Well, what gospel? You had the 12 apostles. They preached the gospel of circumcision, Galatians 2, 7. Well, who are the circumcision? We read that back in Genesis 17. That's the Jews. That's not us. So that, that's the gospel. Well, you look at what gospel did Paul preach, and I will turn to this. Turn to Galatians or Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, and we'll read verse 24. Acts is a transition book, but we can use this verse here, and it'll fit over there in, in Paul's letters. You'll find in in and that Acts 20, 24, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul's going to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Well, what's he tell you in 1 Timothy 2, 6? He's the testifier. He's going to do, he did that. So that, the gospel of the grace of God there, and you know what he's got? It's the gospel of the uncircumcision, Galatians 2, 7. So there's a difference when you compare. You've got the, Peter preaching the gospel to the circumcision. Paul's preaching the gospel of the uncircumcision, the gospel of the dispensation of grace. And that's, that's what we have there. So who did Jesus preach the gospel to when he was on earth? Well, 
John chapter 4, we'll turn to that. John 4, 23, 22. John chapter 4 and verse 22. Who did Jesus preach the gospel to? Who did he send the gospel out to? And you're looking at this. Who did, who did Jesus preach the gospel to? John 4, 22. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So the gospel went to the Jews. All you got to do is turn to Matthew chapter 10 and add that to that. When he commissioned uh, the 12 apostles, he told them, said, don't you go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, but go to the Jews. I mean, that's, that was the gospel of the kingdom that he preached. Well, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7, the gospel that Paul preaches, he, he says, for all, to have all men to be saved, so it's all men. You go to Romans chapter 3 and it's all. All can believe and be saved. That doctrine there in Romans 3 tells you that. Uh, if you don't have that, turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> and looking in Romans chapter 3, and verse 22. Well, verse 21. Romans 3 to 21 tells you there's a dispensation change. It tells you you've got but now. That's us. Paul's telling us, but now the righteousness of God without the law. So, but now we're without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. It's His faithfulness. It's His trustworthiness. By the faith of Jesus Christ unto all. And upon all them that believe, for there's no difference. So there's a big difference. It's not... Jew first, it's to all now the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. That is the gospel today. And then uh, the next question, comparing the, between the prophecy program and uh, or Israel and the body of Christ, you, you think about what was the operating system in Israel. We all know this. But here's a verse. Turn to John chapter 7. We're in over in the New. We'll turn to John chapter 7 and read verse 19. John 7, 19. What was the operating system for Israel here on this earth? In John 7, 19, Jesus was saying, He said, Did not Moses give you the law, and, you're, you're, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why do you go about to kill me? So Moses gave the law. God gave the law to Moses. Moses gave it to, to, to the nation of Israel. And, you know, what's the operating system in the dispensation of grace? Romans 16, 6, 14, for you're not under the law, but under grace. That's the operating system. Save by grace, live by grace. And not, you know, you don't preach and try to put somebody in the, that performance system that a lot of us were under before. When you have liberty in Christ Jesus, you sure don't want to go back into bondage. And I, I, we're thankful for grace. You know, the other, another question, when will Israel be gathered on the earth? And I, I want to share this with you. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. I've got a reason for using this one. Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1. When will Israel be gathered on the earth? And I use the word gathered, and they will be. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. They had a song when we were in Bible school, Behold, He comes, cometh, and every eye shall sing. And the 10,000 people in that auditorium. And you'd, you, look at, look at me. You just feel all emotional, teary eyed or whatever. He's coming. And they didn't have a clue, second coming. <laughs> now that's something how the flesh works and operates. Revelation 1 7 Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kinds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. We know that's the second coming. And you've got the clouds there. Go back to Matthew 24, 30. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, 30. We know the Lord will come back at His second coming for Israel at the end of the tribulation period. Then He comes back. We understand that. We're gone prior to the tribulation. We'll be caught up, and I'll give you that in just a second. Matthew 24, verse 30. In verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming. Notice in the clouds, that's Revelation 1, 7. You can put Revelation 19 there. Uh, uh, in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, 
and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of, the, of heaven. Well, who's the elect? Israel, believing remnant. Going to be gathered together. So he'll gather them when he comes. Well, what about the body of Christ? When will, when will the body of Christ be gathered? Well, we know this. We're going to have the redemption of our body. We're waiting for the, the Lord to come, and res, the resurrection is going to come. And if we're, if we're dead, we'll be caught up first. And if we're alive, we'll be caught up immediately after them, and we'll be changed. We'll have redemption then. But turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I, I'm going to use the gathering for us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Israel's going to be gathered on the earth. Well, what about us? We're going to be gathered, but not on the earth. We're going up. And uh, we're not earthly people. We're heavenly. And we're, not the, we're not Israel. We're the body of Christ. So going back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and reading this passage of Scripture, in verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be a gathering. I mean, we call it the rapture, but we're, we're going to be called up. We're going to be gathered together. We're going to go up in the air. Israel, when he comes back at the second coming, they'll be gathered here on this earth. So they remain down here. That, that's the difference. And you'll, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven. It's going to be a personal thing for us. He comes, and we're going to be called up and meet, meet the Lord in the air. Well, what will be the completion of this gathering for Israel and the body of Christ? There's got to be a completion, and Paul tells you what it is. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. <clears throat> what will be co the completion of this gathering for Israel and the body of Christ? Put it that way. Verse 10, it says, well, verse 9, having made, on the, made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Well, what's the intent and purpose behind that? That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Notice that. Look what's going to happen there in that verse there. What he, he said there, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Well, who's in Christ? Will Israel be in Christ? Yes, they will. Will the body of Christ? We're in Christ. And he's going to gather together there. You read that, that the dispensation of the fullness of times, uh, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, that's us, and also which are on earth, that's the nation of Israel, even in him. Now, that's a blessing to see that. And see the difference but by dividing the Bible up today and we, un we understand this. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And verse 16. Colossians 1, 16. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, notice that, in heaven and in, that are in earth, Visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. You've got the all things. Heaven, you've got earth. You've got the, the rule, the governmental authority on, in heaven, you've got it on earth, you will have. So it's all in Christ. He's the head of all things. Uh, he'll, be, he'll be on the throne and He'll get all the glory and honor out of it. And I can say today to you, I am thankful for grace. I'm thankful that I'm saved, that I know that I'm saved, and I'm thankful for a Bible that I can trust. And I'm thankful that by trusting the Word of God, I believe what I read. And by believing what I read and rightly dividing it, I can come to the knowledge of the truth. And I have the truth today. And I want to learn more. I don't have near as much as I want. I'm still learning, still growing. And, but it's, I'm thankful that we can divide the Bible and we can identify the basic division of the Bible between prophecy and mystery and between Israel and the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for this precious time for all the saints today. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much.